I am going to diverge from the content of the book for the remainder of chapter five. Proteins are defined as macromolecules built of amino acids. As I mentioned with peptides, the cutoff between a polypeptide and a peptide is somewhat arbitrary. I would use 10,000 molecular weight as an arbitrary cutoff myself, but some biochemists I have known have claimed that nothing is a protein unless it has a molecular weight of 1 million. That, by the way, is a very extreme view. But other people may choose 25,000 molecular weight as their cutoff or 5,000 molecular weight as their cutoff. There are potentially a huge number of proteins. To be precise, there are 20 to the nth possibilities. And it can be any number of amino acids in that protein. Consequently, protein chemistry can be a little bit overwhelming, and there are not less than six different ways that we can classify proteins. One of the most important is whether a protein is simple or conjugated. Simple means that it is made up only of amino acids, and conjugated means that it has some other kind of group. Three important terms required to discuss conjugated proteins are apoprotein, holoprotein, and prosthetic group. This small figure shows that when an apoprotein and a prosthetic group join together, they make a holoprotein. Importantly, prosthetic groups are tightly bound to the protein. To use one example, the heme group is the prosthetic group of hemoglobin and is involved in oxygen transport. Proteins can be defined as either globular or fibrous. And I will now switch to a program called RASMOL to do a demonstration. What I have done here is to load a protein called albumin, which is the major protein of blood, and I am showing it in a ribbon form. You will note that this protein is almost entirely beta sheet, though we have to get to chapter six before that makes sense. If I begin to rotate this protein, you will notice that it is approximately as long as it is wide. If I switch to a protein called collagen and display it in ribbon form also, you will notice as I rotate it that the length is much longer than the diameter is. Consequently, we use a 10 to 1 ratio as an arbitrary division between globular and fibrous. Proteins have many functions, some of which are listed here, but I will not elaborate uh, until the next chapter.
proteins have four possible levels of structure. The primary structure is a sequence of amino acids plus disulfide bonds. Secondary structure is a localized three-dimensional shape that we will discuss in chapter six. Tertiary structure is a global three-dimensional shape. All proteins have these three levels of structure. Some proteins have quaternary structure. This is only proteins which have two or more polypeptides. Primary structure is the sequence of amino acids, including disulfide bond locations. In order to determine primary structure, we must have a pure protein with which to work. Much of the discussion of purifying proteins is in the tools of biochemistry section at the end of chapter five. In order to purify proteins though, some things which are very important is to keep the protein cold while working on it. Secondly, be very gentle with it. And thirdly, we must have an assay or means of detection for the protein we are interested in. One technique used to purify proteins is size exclusion chromatography. This purification technique takes advantage of the fact that proteins are of a variable number of amino acids. One of the confusing things about this technique is that smaller proteins take a longer time to come through the column than larger proteins. This is because the smaller protein can enter into the beads used in the chromatography and spend more time inside beads. There are other techniques of chromatography, including separating by affinity, charge, and other techniques. Due to the nature of this course, we will not discuss those techniques further at this time. Once we have a pure protein, we can begin to determine its structure. One technique which is used to do that, for which Sanger won his first Nobel Prize, is to use a molecule called FTNB for short which will bind specifically to the amino group of a polypeptide. I am showing just a tetrapeptide in my slide with the amino terminal amino acid highlighted in red. The labeled protein is then hydrolyzed into substituent amino acids of which the amino terminus is labeled with a fluorescent yellow tag and can be identified. The limitation to this technique should become immediately obvious. A refinement of the technique is referred to as Edmund degradation, which uses the molecule phenyl isothiocyanate, or PITSI for short, which is shown on the right hand side of this slide. Like FDNB, PITSI will label the amino terminus, but if we use anhydrous acid for a short period of time, the first peptide bond will be more labile and therefore more quickly cleaved than the other peptide bonds. Subsequently, we can do something like size exclusion chromatography to separate that first amino acid from the peptide and repeat the process with the remaining polypeptide. In this way, we can sequence proteins of 50 to 200 amino acids or so. As discussed at the outset, primary structure is the sequence of amino acids and disulfide bond locations. 
determination of the disulfide bond location is more technically challenging, and I will not discuss that chemistry. But it should be noted that the forces involved in primary structure are covalent strong forces.